Welcome back, everyone. Well, I'm delighted to be here at the IGF studio, stepped into the studio. We have Barry Gardner, former Shadow Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change and MP for Brent North, a member of parliament for the Labour Party. So we're going to get straight to it. This is all about tech solutions for climate. We don't need to know why. Let me read you a, a quotation, Prime Minister Modi, to the US Congress just last week. The one sun, one world, one grid seeks to join us all in connecting the world with clean energy. When you hear a prime minister speak like that, kind of what does that mean to you? It means that somebody has actually understood the scale of the problem. You know, the, I, I think one of the, the real issues today is that every country is talking about climate security. We've got to be secure. We've got to build a wall and protect ourselves. You know, there's no such thing as climate security. Mm. The only security is if we act not as a fortress, but if we act as a village. And what Prime Minister Modi is talking about is connecting up the world so that those who say, oh, well, the sun doesn't shine all the time, you mm. know, well, actually, it does. And that's the whole point. If you harness the power of the sun when it is shining and you can transport it through interconnectors to where it's not shining but where it's needed, then actually you develop an energy grid that is a global green grid. And that's what OSAWOG, the one sun, one world, mm. one grid, I'm afraid it's, it's the worst acronym <laughs> in the world. Um, but it's, it's a great concept. And it, it understands that we can tackle climate change, but we need to think about doing it together mm. and not building barriers to cooperation. And that's what his speech in, in Washington was about. It was what he said when he came to uh, the Glasgow COP, uh, COP26, and launched the Green Grid initiative there with our then Prime Minister of three or four ago, I yeah, can't, so we lost track. <laughs> can't remember. But, um, you know, that, these are important ideas, and, and it's just great that India and the UK are working on them together. So I want to talk about that idea of approaching the issue as a village and take your example there of solar. One of the projects that I know that you've been involved with is this idea of harnessing solar energy in Morocco and building a solar pipeline um, to the United Kingdom. I'd love to hear a little more about that project um, in terms of the potential that it has for solving some of our energy issues in the UK. Sure. Um, well, look, it, it's a, a company called Xlinx, um, in association with a guy called Paddy Padmanathan, who's, who's built probably more solar uh, arrays than just about anybody else in the world. Um, if you're building a solar array in, in the Maghreb, um, you can get down to 1.7, 1.5 cents a kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're talking major cost reductions. Your cost is then going to be storage and transport. Um, and there's, there's different ways of doing it. If, if you look at uh, generation like the Noor plant, which is a, a solar salt, it's a, a huge kilometers wide solar disk array, like a, like a great big solar panel, like a, a, a satellite dish, mm. um, directing that solar power onto salt, onto molten salt mm. on a pillar storing that energy, incredible, in, incredible concentration of power. The key then is you store it, you take it to where it's needed, and of course the, the project that they're looking at would be to bring it from, uh, Madaga from Morocco, Morocco right up through into the southwest of, of the UK. Um, what they need though is a regulatory environment mm. that's going to allow that to happen. And that means the government being prepared to look at contracts for difference for Tell such a pipeline. Tell us what that means. Well, a contract for difference means that you, you've got a, a, a standard price uh, which you will be uh, paying for, for the energy that you, you bring in. If it comes either above that, um, then that is mitigated. Mm -hmm. Or if it goes below that, 
uh, then, then that is mitigated. So it's a way of the government hedging the bets, mm -hmm. but ensuring a decent price for the investor to, to put the funding in in the first place. And that's what you need. You need that secure investment model, because without that stability, without that clarity, um, without that long-term commitment, mm. investors aren't going to come aboard, because you know putting down a pipeline running from Africa to the UK is is an expensive business. Yeah. Um, it can be done very easily, um, but it needs... It needs stability, it needs, it needs stability continuity. And, and, yeah, confidence. Also, there's an issue around the grid networks, right? Um, and this has been a, an issue in the United Kingdom for, for quite some time. If you want a really good article to read, to read I, the, the one that I've read that finally made sense to me was in The Economist a few months ago. But talk us about this idea of of what the constraints of the current system are and where we need to move to. Okay. We have a huge problem in the UK. In fact, I, I was uh, talking to one of the, uh, the speakers from Monday who was talking to us on infrastructure on Monday, um, just at, at lunch earlier today. And he said, oh, I thought it was only in India that we had this problem. I said, oh, no, it's, it's in the UK as well. We have uh, power projects which are unable uh, to deliver into the grid network. A uh, hydro power project in, in Scotland mm. um, can produce X megawatts. It's only able to transmit half of the power mm. because the grid connectivity isn't there. Some projects are waiting literally four or five years to get the grid connection. Um, so we need grid connectivity, but we actually need a, a whole transformation of our regulatory regime. I think many would point the finger at the regulator for not having uh, really tackled this problem before now. Um, would you point your finger at the regulator? Yes, I would. I'd also point it at the government, and mm -hmm. I, I'd point a bit of it at National Grid themselves. I don't think they've moved fast enough mm -hmm. um, in this area either. Um, Is it an investment problem? What's behind that? Uh, there, there's a number of issues. Um, one of the, the, the key constraints is that they are only allowed to move to put the connection in place once the power project is there. Right. So there are some people that say, I want to be able to connect here, uh, and I'm going to build the, 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 the power project. I'm going to build my hydroelectric power, my tidal power, whatever it is, and my solar array, my wind power. But the grid can't actually put the infrastructure in place in anticipation of that. Mm. that. That's ridiculous. But there are also people who are then blocking up the system um, with, their, uh, with their projects, uh, who are taking precedence on the system over uh, power projects that could actually come to fruition much earlier. So those are some of the constraints of the system. Anything else you'd point to? <laughs> um, I think, um, I think some of the investors would say that we need a more competitive uh, market so that not only three or four people are allowed to, to actually construct. Um, uh, but we do need to change our grid to a digitalized grid. Mm. Uh, and that is a huge transformation. We need to do, in effect, what we did for our communications, for our, our telephones to mobile phones. We need to be doing that for the grid. And we need the grid connectivity at a local level so that instead of my putting 20 solar panels on my roof and if I have a surplus having to sell it back to the grid and then if you need more electricity you can then buy it off the grid, I should be able to sell directly to you. We should be actually operating a very smart grid mm. at a local area where we're buying and selling from each other without having a centralized provider. But that takes a real step change in technology, and it needs that digital technology. Interesting, and do you think we'll get there? Oh yes, we will. Um, by when? Um, oh, I would say by a Labour government. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Don't laugh out there, don't laugh. <laughs> but, I, but that's quite soon, potentially, yes. right? Potentially it is, and, and, and that's what I look forward to. Well, let's talk about that, because I want to talk about the Green Power Plan, yep. which I spoke about with Sir Keir Starmer earlier this week. I wonder if, I mean, off the, off the record, of course, here. Of course. <laughs> Do you think just that's... Just between you and no, me. No, just between you and me and the, you know, one or two in the room and maybe one or two online. Is that enough? Is 
that enough money going into clean technology in the United Kingdom to make us as competitive as we need to when money is being sucked like a Hoover uh, into the United States and into Europe with their own plans? Um, good question. Money is going, investment is now leaking away to the US. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act has been a, a brilliant coup yeah. by the Biden administration. I, I think it's, it will be the biggest legacy, certainly, if he gets a second term of his first term, bar none. It, it, it's a major, major achievement. Um, 28 billion, which is what uh, the Labour Party has uh, said it will do, or at least it, at first we said we would do it, now we're saying we'll do it in the second part, we'll ramp up and do it in the second part of a, a parliamentary term, um, is substantial, is competitive. I think the Committee on Climate Change would say it's not quite enough, mm. um, but it will be leveraging in huge amounts from the private sector. And don't forget one of the problems that the US has is when they're thinking about delivering all this, they don't have a national grid like we do. Mm. They have state grid operators. They have state regulation to cope with as well. In many senses, that's for an investor thinking of the US, they have to think at a state level, not just at a federal level. In that respect, I believe that the UK is a more attractive proposition. Um, I would say that we represent a more stable political framework because both parties in the UK are committed to net zero. I don't think anybody would claim that that is true in the United States. Mm. You know, we've talked about regulation, we've talked a little bit about investment, but I wonder, I want to quote um, something that I, you said early, a few years ago, we must stop investing in our own demise. Uh, the financial sector is, is fueling climate change. Uh, I wonder if you've seen a change since, since you said that. Are, are you seeing asset managers, people from the City of London, recognizing the scale of the importance of this issue? Is there further to go? If I remember correctly the article that you're referring to, um, I think that article ba began by saying, if you took all the investment in the city of London mm. and summed it up, it would represent, was it the ninth largest country? You have a uh, good memory. A country, it would <laughs> yeah. be the ninth largest investor. Yeah. Sit above uh, Canada or Germany. Above Canada yeah. or Germany, that's right. Um, and the honest truth is, there are a lot of people in the financial markets who understand that it's now important commercially to do this. There's a lot of greenwashing. Um, and there is not yet a full understanding of just what the impacts of climate change mean for the financial system. Mm. Mark Carney and Michael Bloomberg did an absolutely superb job with the task force, um, uh, the TCFD. We need it for sustainability as a whole, uh, not just for, for climate uh, financial risks. We need it for biodiversity and the whole of the uh, environment. And these environmental risks are going to completely undermine the capacity of capital to get insurance. Because if you're living in an inherently uh, climate risky environment, not being able to get insurance undermines the basis of your system. Uh, there is a proposal, um, and indeed I think I, I adverted to it at the end of the article you're referring to, um, that next year when we have the 80th anniversary of the Bretton Woods Conference, mm. which said, how do we reshape the entire financial system as we come out of the Second World War? How do we do that globally? There is a move now to get uh, a new Bretton Woods, uh, a new conference 
that is saying, let's, let's really structure the, the whole global financial market to deliver on climate and environmental sustainability. And I think that's what's needed because at the moment, yes, companies and funds are doing some mm. things, they're not doing enough. Interesting. Well, everybody who's here watching online, stay tuned. May well see Barry Gardner have an interesting role if, uh, if Labour does come back to power in the coming years here in the United Kingdom. <laughs>